everyone. We're ready to have another great day today. Wasn't that Canadian barbecue wonderful? Very good. Thank you for all the anniversary members that put that together. It was just a wonderful time, and God planned the sun at just the right time, right? We were able to get out and enjoy uh, each other outside. So again, welcome to the worship service here at ASA 2023, and greetings to those on the live stream as well. The Sunday morning worship service has come to be a highlight at the ASA annual meetings, and there's nothing like listening to a room full of scientists and theologians worshiping Christ together. So we're just delighted to be here. We have a uh, few people that have commented on how wonderful the weekend is going and just feeling the presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, so we're just delighted that God is present in a powerful way this weekend. Now I invite you to take a moment to prepare your hearts for worship and watching God be present over the comings and goings of this weekend. If you can stand, please join me in the call to worship. It's taken from Psalm 34, 1 through 3. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I'll ask you to remain standing as we uh, begin our worship by lifting our voices uh, together in praise. Please join me in song. Now the 
congregation again as their songs this morning. Reading from Philippians 3, 7 to 14. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, Jesus Christ my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Well, good morning. It is a, a real honor and privilege to introduce our preacher for this morning, Dr. Patrick Franklin. Uh, Patrick is Associate Professor of Theology at Tyndall University and, and Seminary, which is uh, just uh, to the east of us in uh, neighboring uh, Toronto. And he served a similar position at Providence University College in Manitoba. 
And while he was in Manitoba, that's where he was instrumental in starting up the Manitoba chapter of the ASA, uh, CSCA. Uh, Patrick is uh, a fellow of the ASA, a former uh, book review editor for Perspectives, and has been on the executive council of the CSCA, serving as vice president, then president, and currently as past president. Now, here's one thing I would like to share with you. It was four years ago to the day when we started, commenced our annual meeting on Friday, July 28th. And on that day, four years ago, Patrick suffered a, an extremely serious and life and death health issue. And I say life and death because uh, Patrick expired a couple of times under care over the ensuing weeks. And he spent uh, months in hospital, much of that time in intensive care. But here he is. <laughs> And, and praise God, it, it serves for me as, as the epitome of the interaction of science, and that is medicine, and faith, and that is prayer. And so I, I can think of no one more appropriate to be sharing a message with us today than Patrick. So thank you, Patrick, and carry on. Well, good morning. I'm emotional already. That's not a good sign. <laughs> or maybe it is. Uh, I just want to start by uh, saying what a privilege it is to be here. And, uh, and, I, and I mean that in the deepest, deepest way. Um, I know not all of you know me, but a number of you were following my health crisis uh, when my wife, Elena, was writing about it, blogging about it. And uh, she knew that I knew some of you and she heard about the ASA and the CSA for me, but she didn't know anybody herself. She was absolutely blown away by you people. Yeah, your prayers, your gifts, your, uh, your faith, uh, just incredibly blown away. So thank you. Okay, moving forward together. The future of faith and science. What a great title. I didn't come up with that myself, just so you know. Uh, moving forward together, the future of faith and science. I thought it'd be a good idea for us to ponder this a little bit uh, together this morning and to maybe ask a couple of questions about it. For example, moving forward to where exactly? What's the goal? What's the destination? What is this future we're looking for? Now, in terms of the science, I'm a theologian. I can't really tell you much about that. <laughs> and, and of course, you know, science, uh, as Alistair McGrath says, is always changing, right? Uh, it's on a journey. We can predict a little bit what we think might be coming, but uh, there's so much that we can't predict. Science is in progress. And uh, we don't know what future developments will be completely. And we don't know what applications of those developments might be practically. But I think the scripture passage today can inform us on the faith component of moving forward together in science and faith. And what Paul directs our attention to is for us to really pursue with intentionality and passion and focus what should be the center of our faith, the central goal, that goal which supersedes, outranks, and realigns every other goal that we might have and that is Christ himself, the living, resurrected Lord of our lives. And more specifically, Paul instructs us and it encourages us to know Christ, to love him, and to participate in him. Now, we at the ASA and the CSCA agree on this goal. We uh, affirm it in our statements of our beliefs, as well um, in the scriptures, as well as our beliefs uh, in affirming the ancient creeds, the Nicene and the Apostles' creeds, which really have their center 
in Christ as the one who reveals the Father and and sends forth the Spirit uh, to create the church and dwell amongst us. And Paul reminds us of the importance of just how crucial remaining focused on Christ himself really is. And he uses powerful imagery. Uh, It's graphic, it's provocative, it's, it's athletic imagery, right? He uses this language of, I don't look behind me, I strain toward what is ahead. I press on to win the prize, toward that goal. This is not an imagery of Little League soccer. I I used to coach Little League soccer uh, when my boys were like five and six. And let me tell you, it's the most hilarious, entertaining thing you could possibly do. So you're, you're coaching and the game's going on and the ball's up here somewhere. And there's always some kind of like, you know, circular beehive scrum thing going on around the ball. And, and you look out around the rest of the field, and over here, there's a couple of kids looking at the sky because there's some birds going on. There's a couple over here doing jumping jacks. Literally, I look and I see my goalie hanging backwards on the goalpost while the ball's approaching him. So this is not what we want to have in mind in terms of what Paul's saying. What Paul's talking about is the kind of devotion and focus and dedication and sacrifice and blood, sweat, and tears that an athlete has in preparing for that gold medal, to win that gold medal. It's, it's urgent, and it involves a kind of sacrifice. It reminds me of the parable of Jesus when he talks about the man who went and purchased a field, because in this field he had buried a treasure, and he sold everything that he had in order to get this field because the treasure was that precious. And it's a parable of the kingdom of God, And how God's kingdom is supposed to be the most precious thing in our lives. And of course, Jesus himself, as the king of the kingdom, is the most important thing of our lives. So our goal is Christ himself and his call on us. It's good to be reminded of that. Why does Paul stress the importance of such crucial, intense, single-minded focus? Well, I think because there are lots of distractions. There are lots of distractions that would seek to dissuade or or make us move aside or shift our focus, maybe even to try to distort and redefine that goal to make it into something else. And so Paul says we got to be disciplined about this. We have to focus. We have to center our mind. We have to be grounded in Christ because there are many distractions. And when we get distracted, when we focus on something other than Christ as the center, that begins to cause divisions, because if he's not the center, then what we follow is everybody's individual conception of what the goal should be, and we can't be centered in that. At the ASA and at the CSCA, we recognize that some agendas, some goals, some disputes are a distraction from our mission and potentially harmful to our fellowship in Christ. Now, it's not that certain topics are off the table, or that you can't talk about them. Of course not. It's much more about the manner in which we want to engage as an organization. And I think this is very godly. Um, Because of all these distractions, it's so easily to potentially get uh, pulled astray. But we've made it clear in our statements that we want to be an organization. We're We're not an advocacy organization, right? So this is from the webpage, where there's honest disagreement on an aspect of science or Christian faith, or the relationship between the two, the ASA strives to create a safe environment in which dialogue can flourish and diverse, even contrasting ideas can be discussed with courtesy and with respect. Feeling though that um, today, and maybe increasingly in the future, the things that will cause fighting are not so much matters of empirical fact, I think the greater threat to us today in our social context is the threat of ideology and the threat of being co-opted by ideology. Now, what is ideology? It's hard to define. Uh, There's a famous book by Terry Eagleton, uh, kind of a classic, and he goes through like 10 or 12 definitions, and they're all a little bit different. But I think for our purposes, we could say that, you know, as Christians, we might think of ideology as when we shift our focus away from the living Jesus, right, who's a person, who's alive, who's active, and we focus instead on an idea or a system 
or a set of rules, um, or a supreme moral imperative that claims ultimate allegiance that we can't question. Uh, very subtly, we've begun to shift into ideology and be co-opted by ideology because we begin to subsume Christ himself under our ideological conception of him and what needs to happen. It, this is not like a conservative liberal thing. This is, you can have conservative ideologies, and we do, and we can have liberal ideologies, and we do, and we always have to be ready to be aware of those things. And in a sense, every day, be willing to, to lay down our lives, right? As Christ says, if you want to follow me, you've got to crucify yourself. Pick up your cross, follow me daily. And we all have to do that, especially in a culture where our allegiances are being pulled in so many potential different directions. Uh, science is, you know, is a relatively objective discipline, right? It's got methods, and that's really awesome. Scientists can be captive to ideology because we're human, and all of us have the potential of being held captive to that. So I think that's a great threat, and I think it's something we need to be concerned about. One of the problems is the idolatrous and divisive way in which ideology works. We live in an incredibly divisive and polarizing culture. Um, I learned of a survey that was uh, conducted a little while ago by the Edelman Institute, and um, it's on the screen if you're interested. And uh, they conducted this massive survey to try to measure polarization um, caused by ideology in a variety of countries. They had 30-minute interviews, and they interviewed 32,000 respondents across 28 different countries. And uh, one of the findings was particularly stunning. In answer to the statement, if a person strongly disagreed with me or my point of view, only 30% said that they would be willing to help that person if they were in need. Only 20% said they'd be willing to live in the same neighborhood as that person. And again, only 20% said they'd be willing to have them as a co-worker. Uh, and by the way, the numbers for Canada were 26%, 24%, and 19%, respectively. Uh, and just for a little bit of American knowledge, uh, the U.S. was listed as the sixth most polarized country of the 28 measured. So we're all right in the middle of this. Uh, and we, we feel its constraints. I don't think I need to belabor that point. You know, we're not all that different from the Philippian church that Paul was writing to, because a key problem that he's confronting in this passage, if you back up earlier in chapter 3, is really an ideological problem. There was this group that had arisen, um, and it, it was a Jewish faction. Not Judaism itself, per se. Judaism's complex. But a sect, or a faction within Judaism, that had infiltrated the church, that was proselytizing its views, and was causing deep polarization and division. And it was a group that emphasized the importance of Jewish kind of um, ethnic and cultic boundary markers as being honored um, and needing to be applied to Gentile Christians before they could be in the church. The key one being circumcision. So you couldn't be a true Christian unless you were circumcised. There were other markers as well. But notice what happened, that this focus on, you know, the, the, these markers, which are divisive, uh, led to this polarization within this context. Paul himself identifies with them. He even says, you know, once I, I could outdo all of you in your ideology, right? I used to be all of these things and more, right? I, I was more righteous than all of you, right? But now I consider that worthless next to knowing Christ, so Paul characterizes this group as, uh, it describes them rather as being characterized by uh, self-righteousness and self-justification. And he worried that the, some within the Philippian church were going to be vulnerable to this divisive message because they had taken their eyes off of Christ and, and were going to be going with the motions. So he says that people in the church had become focused on earthly rather than heavenly things. Heavenly things doesn't mean having your head in the clouds. It means the things of God, the kingdom of God, God's priorities. Remove themselves from looking at Christ 
and been consumed by earthly things. He says they're focusing on themselves and their desires, a kind of selfish hedonism. And earlier on in chapter 2, verse 21, he says, everyone looks to their own interests. And this lack of focus on Christ and this concern about their own interests led to people being anxious um, and therefore being deprived of their joy, their gratitude, and their peace, which should have been theirs in Christ. Does this sound like our culture to you? Uh, People that grow moralistic and um, self-righteous, self-justified, focused on earthly rather than heavenly things, focusing on themselves and their desires, and characterized by anxiety, experiencing a lot of anxiety. Does that sound like our culture? Does that sound like the church? I think it does. One of the things about ideology is that ideology makes promises that it can't possibly fulfill. It's subtle because ideology tends to name things that actually do need to be addressed. Right? Pro- pointing out problems within society, right? There might be problems that conservatives are worried about. There might be problems that progressives are worried about. But there's a problem because ideology itself can't provide that deep reconciliation, um, that deep making one, that deep shalom that the presence of God ultimately has to bring. And because it can't deliver on its promises, it tends to lead to further senses of self-righteousness Uh, a further sense of othering and looking down on others, further polarization uh, rather than unity uh, and seeking the good of others. So how do we move forward together in Christ? What does this look like? I think Paul gives us um, a couple of good pointers here that we can hear and and grow from this morning. I think every one of us... um, I feel like I wrestle with this every day. Every time you go on social media, it's like you have to like, you're in this sea and you have to go back to your anchor. Where's Christ and and how does he want me to be? And how does he want me to live and treat others, right? First of all, I think uh, Paul calls us to repent. To repent. So if you're wandering around, instead of pursuing the goal, you turn around, you realign yourself to Christ himself. So we, we repent of false allegiances. We repent of being a, uh, placing our allegiance toward other masters, other leaders, systems, philosophies, uh, ideologies, whatever. Paul himself does this. He says, I was all of this, right? I was pursuing all of that. I was ardent. I was a genius, right? I was all of these things. But now, whatever gains for me, I now consider them loss for the sake of Christ. I forget what is behind. Anything that displaced my focus from Christ is actually weighing me down, not helping me run the race. So can we can repent of these things. Secondly, Paul exhorts us to seek to know and to love and to participate in Christ. It's interesting language of participation. Paul says that I might gain Christ and be found in him, in him not having a righteousness of my own, but one that comes from Christ. This language of participation is very interesting in Philippians. We could do a whole sermon on this theme alone. And participation is about this idea that the Christian life isn't just about me and my efforts and what I'm doing for God. It includes that, but it sees that within God's work that he is doing in the world by his spirit and in which he calls us to participate Every chapter highlights this. You go back to chapter one, and Paul says, I'm so thankful for you guys because we're partners together in the gospel. We're participating together. But he says, remember that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to see it through to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. Chapter two, he says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So that's you. That's your agency. But how can we do that? Well, because God is at work within you both to do and even to begin to will to do that which he has called you to do. Chapter 3, I press on, I strive to take hold of the prize. But it's interestingly phrased, I I stretch on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has already taken hold of me. So I'm running the race. My agency has been catalyzed by the Spirit 
and God has already grabbed hold of me and is directing me forward to that prize. And then finally, chapter 4, God promises his peace. And so in light of that, we are to focus on whatever is good and whatever is noble and whatever is true and so forth. Now, two ways in particular that Paul talks about how we can, suffer, we can participate with Christ, one of them is to participate in his sufferings. To participate in his sufferings. I think this has a lot to do with entering into the sufferings of others, coming alongside. I think, too, it, it might point to the fact that, you know, Paul's in chains in Philippians, right? He's in prison for his message. We have to take risks in the Christian life that, you know, sometimes you're going to be misunderstood. You know, you might be associating with the wrong people, right? Um, you might be saying things that trying to be nuanced and people on both sides are attacking you because they hear the other side of the polarization and whatever you're trying to say, right? Uh, and, and so I think we gotta, we got to be careful there. we got to remember that we are called to suffer. Back earlier in the passage, Paul talks about this. Uh, chapter 1, verse 29. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Also to suffer for him. I think a, a brilliant example of this is um, Martin Luther King and, and Jr. and, and the, the message that he lived. And, um, and the living, active demonstration of the faith that, that, that he served and represented. Here's a quotation from uh, one of his speeches called The Power of Nonviolence. You might be a pacifist, you may not be, but I think there's something to learn from what he says here that speaks directly into our culture today. Another thing we had to learn to get over, he says, was the fact that, our, that the nonviolent resistor does not seek to humiliate or defeat the opponent but to win his friendship and understanding. This was always a cry that we had to set before people that our aim is not to defeat the white community, not to humiliate the white community, but to win the friendship of all the persons who had perpetrated this system in the past. The end of violence or the aftermath of violence is bitterness. The aftermath of nonviolence is reconciliation and the creation of a beloved community. A boycott is never an end in itself. It is merely a means to awaken a sense of shame within the oppressor. But the end is reconciliation. The goal is redemption. Now notice, he calls a spade a spade. This is oppression, and it's shameful. <laughs> but he remembers that our ultimate goal is to befriend the other. And so in this highly polarized culture, one of the ways that we need to learn to, to live is to suffer the cross because it's hard to enter into the space of the other. It's threatening. It's hard. You'll be judged. Um, but it's what we're called to do. Secondly, Paul calls us to participate in the power of the resurrection. I love how Michael Byrd and Nijay Gupta talk about this. They say this is the life-giving, death-crushing, and new world-creating power of God. Isn't that great? The life-giving, death-crushing, and new world-creating power of God. That's wonderful. That, that God actually gives us his power to allow new things to emerge in creation. I, I mean, both scientifically as you go about your work, but also just as a person, a person of God, a person of character, a living witness of the person of Jesus. I love how Leslie Newbegin talks about the church. It's supposed to be a sign and a foretaste of the coming kingdom of God. Are we that? Right? Are, are we a sign and a foretaste of reconciliation, redemption, and wholeness, and shalom, uh, and self-giving love? Are, are we that? Paul calls us to be that. This is the call of Christ. One of the things we've got to do in this regard is build trust. What are the ways that we can build trust? Uh, we heard a little bit about trust last night. There's an interesting statistic I came across. Um, and here's actually, there's a bit of good news in this, that as scientists, you actually do have a fair bit of trust in our present day world. I know it may not feel that way, right? Whether in culture or in the church. But part of the issue is that people don't trust in general. They don't trust authorities, period. And in terms of the various authorities that are on the table, science actually doesn't fare too badly. 
Uh, now, there are problems, of course, and we've got to work on building trust, but this is a gift of God. As you move out into the world, you carry great um, credibility and great responsibility that comes along with that. So God's resurrection power going with you to be a witness through your work, through your mentoring, through all that you're doing. Um, and don't shortchange yourself on the trust you actually do have culturally, because um, God can use that. I want to conclude by uh, citing Dietrich Bonhoeffer. <laughs> Those of you who know me won't be surprised by this. <laughs> Bonhoeffer wrote a lot about Christian community, and he was living in a deeply polarized society, a deeply troubling, evil society, right? Nazi Germany. He was part of the Confessing Church. He ended up uh, losing his life for being part of the resistance movement. And it's interesting that though he joined a revolutionary counter-response, he didn't become a kind of ideologue. He didn't say what we need instead of the state church is like a different kind of revolutionary political church. That's just going to be the opposite of everything we're seeing, right? So that we can have our own camps, you know, and we can do our... He actually says, no, 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 we have to step back and we have to recenter in Christ. He writes in his book, Life Together, that Christian community is not an ideal that we human beings create or achieve. It's a reality that God establishes in Christ by the Spirit into which we are called to participate. That's important because he goes on to say that when we don't see that, we, we tend to disrupt what the church is and what Christian community is. He says, only in Jesus Christ are we one. Only through him are we bound together. He remains the one and only mediator throughout eternity. He says, every human idealized image that is brought into the Christian community is a hindrance to genuine community and must be broken up so that genuine community can survive. Those who love their dream of a Christian community more than the Christian community itself become destroyers of that Christian community, even though their personal intentions may be ever so honest, earnest, and sacrificial. Sometimes a righteous cause can also be an oppressive one because we think that we can make it happen. and We don't trust God. In contrast, Paul calls us to fix our eyes on Christ. And uh, I want to close by just praying and doing that. Um, having us center our, our hearts and our minds on Christ. Think of Philippians chapter 2 where Paul says your attitude needs to be that of Christ Jesus, who being very nature God, didn't grasp onto that status, but came down and became one of us to suffer shame and humiliation and death so that we could be redeemed in him. Let's pray together as we focus on the one who is our goal, our future, our life. Lord Jesus, uh, we as your followers, uh, filled by your spirit, um, made one by your Spirit, um, propelled into the future by your Spirit. Confess that we sin before you in thought, in word, and in deed, by what we do and by what we fail to do. Uh, we live in a culture that is struggling. And if we're honest, we're all complicit with it in one way or another. And so, Lord, call us again and again and again daily to our first love, our primary allegiance, our Lord Jesus Christ. And send us into this world to be his witnesses, his representatives, to live out and be a foretaste as individuals, but also as your church together as communities of what the kingdom of God actually looks like. Holy Spirit, you make it happen. You're the one that dawns the future in the present. You're the one that shines through us, even though we are walking in darkness. So fill us and send us, Lord. Uh, help us to show compassion to others. Help us to uh, love those who we disagree with, even our enemies, as Christ did. We pray these things in his name and for his glory. Amen. It is a tradition at the Sunday morning worship service
to designate our offering to a charity in the geographic region in which we're meeting. This year, we're pleased to give our offering to Global Scholars Canada. In a few moments, the offering plates will be passed during the special music, and you'll have an opportunity to make a gift to Global Scholars. The number of ways that you can give are cash or check, Canadian or American. You can go to the ASA or the CSCA website and make a gift through uh, the giving portals on each of those websites, or you can make a gift through Venmo at American Scientific Affiliation. We're delighted to have Peter Skirman with us this weekend participating in the meeting. Peter is a CSCA member and he is the executive director of Global Scholars Network. And I'd like to invite Peter up now to say a few words about the organization. Welcome, Peter. Patrick just talked about uh, suffering with others and taking risks. I'm the executive director of Global Scholars Canada, which is a Canadian charity that from the start noticed that there was an unequal distribution of scholars on the planet, and particularly Christian scholars. We are a Canadian guild that's focused on equipping and sending Christian academics into cross-cultural and transnational service in higher education. You tell us where you want to go, and we'll help you raise the funds to get there. Think Christian Professors Without Borders. We are poised to be a redemptive influence in departments and with students and in universities around the globe. And I'll give you two quick examples. One is a theologian, Dr. Manhi Yun, who teaches at our Christian Studies Center at the University of the Gambia. We provide scholarships so that the Christian minority there can enroll and be trained as local leaders for the church in a country that is a 98% Muslim majority. Secondly, Dr. David Koizis, one of the leading scholars in the intersection of Christian faith and politics. He connects with the world through lectures, panel discussions, and courses he teaches from his basement in Hamilton, Ontario, about an hour from here. His book, Visions and Illusions, which is on, incidentally, discerning political ideologies, uh, has now been published in Portuguese and in Spanish. So he's connecting, like, you, once you start publishing Spanish, think of your market, you know, your readership, and how that expands by multiple millions. So we're, we're very small here in Canada. We're three part-time staff. We're 12 scholars. But we partner with the American Global Scholars and the International Society of Christian Scholars, which serves about 1,000 scholars worldwide helping people get together with others in their discipline around the world to mentor each other, edit papers together, access databases, etc. So our goal is to help academics find support for the scholarship and teaching that God has called them to do so that student leaders will emerge, the gospel will be heard in word and research, and so lives and countries can be transformed towards the shalom of the world. Such academic work, I believe, is justice work. It's justice work. Redistributing scholars and scholarship more equitably on the planet so that knowledge and practice and faith can be exchanged, shared, and in so doing, bless all nations, which is the goal from Abraham onward. I'll be presenting a paper later today on brain drain and brain grain again to talk a little bit more about what we do. Thank you so much for having us featured today and for your offerings.
Loving and gracious God, we do thank you for the opportunity that we have just experienced to return some of the many blessings that you cast upon us back to your good use, and particularly the good work of Global Scholars Canada. So we pray for your blessings upon those funds. We also uh, uplift our time together and we thank you for the experience that we have shared thus far and we know that we will continue to experience in uh, the rest of today and tomorrow. We pray for traveling mercies upon all after we conclude. We thank you for your message, your word uh, that we have received this day. And it's heartfelt application and meaning for our lives in this very challenging time of ideological struggles, divisiveness, and uh, leadership focused on hurling insults rather than hurling love, which is more our thing. We thank you that uh, in these troubled times and as we meditate upon Patrick's words that uh, we know there is a tendency to, uh, in, in the midst of such challenges, to be comforted by our focus on our salvation and how we are to accomplish that and where that will take us to your heavenly kingdom. When all the time, there is Jesus preaching, teaching, and storytelling about how we are to bring that heavenly grace and that heavenly kingdom to right here around us on earth, right in the opposite direction. And so we thank you and praise you for the opportunities as, as we immerse ourselves in, in the wonders of science. We discover how much that can bring you glory and bring us to a closer understanding of just who you are, just how your Holy Spirit works, 
and how we can use the sacrificial love of Christ through his death and resurrection uh, to make this a better world. Remind us that you continue to meet with us here in the time ahead. And for that, we can only give you praise and glory. We praise you for the wonders of the music we have received throughout this conference time as well. So be with us and keep us mindful of that fact. For we pray these things in the name of the one who guides us, walks with us, who interprets all scripture for us. And that is Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Uh, I'm going to invite you to stand. Bob mentioned that there might be a tradition uh, at these conferences of singing How Great Thou Art. So I said, well, we can do that. And uh, um, I like this, this third line about, uh, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds I hands have made. Isn't, isn't the, the whole power of science in, in teaching us to pay attention, right? And, uh, and so... Uh, if we can be people who pay better attention to what God has wrought and what God is up to, then I think that's a good thing. So thank you for doing that. Oh Lord,
finally, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. May you be filled with the love of God and the presence of His Spirit as you go about the rest of this day in this conference. God bless you. Amen.